Welcome to The Best Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Bradley H. Werrell, and we're here to explore options and potentials to help us grow as individuals and as a community with one another in these difficult times and challenging times. We're exploring all manner of potentials related to the human experience, physical, psychological, medical, spiritual. It's a wonderful opportunity that we now experience in this critical phase of our human evolution. And I welcome you to join us in our podcast, become more aware and identify with people who are helpful and supportive of you in your efforts as a human being on this planet and elsewhere too. We're going to be meeting people who are doing things that are widely variant from what is so-called normal within our society. In the creative space, within the social space, our common purpose, seeking to generate positive potentials to improve the lives of everyone in our sphere of influence, and to expand that sphere of influence so that we may positively influence others that are not yet engaged directly with us. That's the goal here. We will learn more about each other as we go. I wish you the very best. Thank you very much for tuning in. So I'm, as everybody knows, I'm Brad Werrell. I'm the uh, host of Best Medicine. And I've got with me today, uh, Casey Krejci, a wonderful gentleman who has uh, done a wide variety of things, which I will start with related to the health field um, on his work with Living Fuel, which we'll learn more about, and onto and extending up through the Great Awakening Project and the Spiritual War for America, which is quite an interesting topic of uh, momentary interest. How about that? Yeah, timely interest. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's huge. It's just uh, a crucial moment that we uh, enjoy in history here, it seems. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, Brad, it's a, a joy and a pleasure to be on your show. Congratulations on your show. And uh, I think it's going to be great. I mean, you're going to have great guests and you're going to change a lot of lives, which is why I want to be involved. I appreciate that. Thank you. So st tell me how you got started on this pathway with the living fuel thing. Yeah, it's a great story. My wife was Miss Florida and she was Miss Florida USA and she was, uh, she competed both Miss America and Miss USA and just a beautiful woman. And, you know, fast forward a few years and we're married, we have one child and she went from a, a fearless woman to like stricken with panic attacks and clinical depression and suicidal thoughts. Oh my. And it's like a radical change. It's almost like she caught a cold. It's so, so, uh, so instantaneous. And so at the time, I didn't know much. I was the CEO of a medical device company called Arsco Medical Systems. And we, I didn't know anything about alternative medicine. Uh, so we went to a regular doctor, family practice doc. And the doctor basically handed me a book, kind of giddy. Oh, yeah, we know how to treat this. It's called Anxiety Disorder and Xanax, Zoloft, and Psychotherapy. And they handed me the book. It said Anxiety Disorder. And I started looking through it. I said, well, what do we know about this? Well, I said, we don't know a lot, uh, but we know how to treat it. And I said, well, how long is she going to have to take these meds, Xanax and Zoloft and psychotherapy? And, and, and I said, and they said, well, we don't really know, but she can live a normal life on these. And I said to myself, you know, I don't know much about this, but that don't sound right. Because, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my wife was perfect and subsequently in bound to her room with fear for oh two weeks straight, you know? And so, so this cannot be the answer, but my wife was desperate. So she said, said we're going to do it. It was really only a couple of weeks later, she came and said, these meds are making me crazy and sitting on some dude's couch. I don't know. Tell him about my life is not working for me. She says, I'm not doing it anymore. We're going to find another way. And so about that point in time, I'd made a decision. I was going to dive in the literature and I wasn't coming out without an answer. Uh, so a 10 year period of research and trial and error, my company was born. My best selling books were born. Um, Monica got healed and you know, she hasn't had those meds in over 25 years. And so we've been able to help many thousands of people overcome their own health situations as a direct result. But what we learned from Living Fuel is that the same dis the metabolic dysfunction, the same deficiencies drive just about every disease. And that the same thing that helped her get through, and also I discovered there are seven things in the literature 
that come up again and again and again, and she was deficient in all of them. I mean, I gave a talk earlier today and a group of older people and I had them give themselves a little score with each one of the seven. And every one of them was in, in pretty rough shape. You know, if you have a six or less, you got physiologic consequences and you got seven areas. And a lot of them are six or less in most six or seven areas. And so most people watching right now are going to be six or less and at least four of the seven. And so that there's a lot more than just nutrition. I figured out, although clinical nutrition really was key in our case. And so, so this year, this now we we've helped people all around the world with all kinds of health situations from trying to get to another level of performance for athletes to, because, because a fr my friend uh, uh, from Canada, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Wells, Dr. Greg Wells, he's a performance specialist and he, he runs the Olympic teams up there uh, for nutrition profiles and, and exercise programs. And he said he worked for sick, ch ch sick children's hospital. He said that, that someone sick on the edge of death have a lot of metabolic similarities to an athlete trying to push it to the very edge. Hmm. And it's really a lot to be learned from that. So, so what's interesting is that you don't really have a lot of communication from the performance folks uh, with the, with the, with the health folks. And so if you ask the, you ask every one of the performance folks, Hey, name a nutrient that actually has an impact and it increases performance on every level. They would invariably they say protein. You know, you, you ask the, the, the people in the health side, they don't have an answer for that question, you know, and, and they'll tell you too much protein is bad. So, so it's like this information is out there, but there really hasn't been a conduit to cross it over. So one of the things I've enjoyed is now working with world-class athletes and working with very sick people and working in cancer nutrition and working in COVID and all these things. You see the incredible similarities of the body. Unless you are properly neutrified, you are at risk and just fill in the blank. So That's right. there's the short story. It seems interesting to me that uh, what came to my mind when uh, you were uh, discussing that pathway is that there's like the, the nutrients don't necessarily have to neutrify the body itself, but the uh, microbiota of the gut and change their function because that can change the behavior of an individual quite radically. And it, that is very true. But again, that's one of 12 major systems that you have to address. That's right. And that's it's right. very important. It's interesting that now, you know, that as of several years ago, you would know, but, but a lot of your viewers wouldn't know that they discovered there are neurons in the gut and neurons in the heart and neurons in the head. And so this gut heart brain connection is pretty extraordinary and your heart does speak. And so, so it's pretty, pretty extraordinary when you do realize the power of the gut and the problem with the gut is you know, pretty ubiquitous because people eat terribly and the gut is in trouble. That's why it's a higher impact area because people are so messed up in that area. Oh yeah. But Living Fuel, our, our products actually address all 12 major body systems, including the gut. And you have some kind of mechanism or, or uh, systematic uh, assessment plan or program? No, see, that's your job, doctor. Okay, I don't know. You're supposed to train me. Yeah, so the assessment, though, the assessment, the thing is, we know that just about everybody's deficient in a number of things, okay? You could start with potassium, magnesium, um, uh, oh, I don't know, zinc. You're talking about a lot of the trace minerals, a lot of the minerals particularly. Then you go to the, to the vitamin side, B12, and you look at what kind of folic acid they're taking. They're probably taking folic acid when they should be taking 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So, so there's so many things to look at. And so, so people are now, the, the government now changed it where people put folic acid there. And they don't put, folic acid is by nature synthetic, right? So, so we use 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, even though it's 10 times the cost because that is the active form of folate. And so, so there's that, that goes across the board. And you heard my assistant now is barking in the background. I hope that's okay. Um, so <laughs> so the, these, everyone, everyone has a number of things which they're deficient in and they don't, they don't work to, to figure out what these are for one. And they don't take the right amounts or like, like, potassium let's say for instance just about everybody has low, and when they age they have low acid in their stomach a lot of people are taking gastric reflux medication um but the gastric reflux medication is thinking they have too high of acid but the truth is most of them have too low acid and then when you add proton pump inhibitors the purple pill on top of that you literally shut down the gut's ability to digest proteins and fats 
And so that becomes a big issue in people's health. And so digestion, when people are all the time walking around drinking alkaline water and they're saying, hey, I just need to be more alkaline. I'm going to not get sick because I'm more alkaline. Well, guess what? When you're eating a steak, you don't want to be alkaline, right? So you don't want to be taking proton pump inhibitors and you don't want to be taking alkaline water. You want to be taking vinegar before you eat and probably digestive enzymes, right? Because you want to take that protein, that source of steak and, and fat and tear it down and be able to use it. Otherwise, it just passes and you don't, you don't get the benefits of it. That's right. So uh, I'll, I'll, can I call a break here and say, are you okay with that bark? Or you want to start? No, no, it? that's fine. You're good. I'm just, we'll, 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 we'll let them work it out. It's, it's okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, so the, the body systems, you have to get your eyes, you know, things like astaxanthin, zeaxanthin, lutein, lutein. The eye health is super important. What goes on in the eyes is really a, a window to what's happening in the rest of the body. Remember, that's, that's just small vessels that we're talking about. Right. And if those, those small vessels clog, you know, you got problems in other places in the body. So, so a lot of things do go on in the eyes. And if you can, if you can make the eye healthy, you actually are looking at the vascular system in a really healthy way you know, throughout the rest of the body. So there's so much we know that we can do, but so many people don't do them. They, they don't focus on them. And, and as I was saying to the group today, I said a lot of people... I always say to them, I said that they would rather die than change their habits and they're dying to prove it. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to say, listen, there is a better way. It's particularly when you, when you have a general uh, level of health, that's when it's time to treat it like an emergency. Don't let your doctor tell you you have pre-diabetes and don't worry, just take this pill. You know, metformin will get you through. No, you have to change it up. We have to be willing to make changes. So the areas that I noticed uh, in the literature and I wrote about them in my best-selling books is that hydration, nutrition, exercise, stress, sleep, environmental hazards, and meditation and prayer. And if you're on a continuum, if, the, if everyone listening will write them down and then give themselves a score based on their own knowledge, give yourself a score on hydration, give yourself a score on nutrition, give yourself a score on exercise, give yourself a score on stress, on sleep. On environmental hazards, that would be like, you know, do you have the the guy spraying your yard for weeds every week? Uh, do you do you eat genetically modified foods? You know, do you drink tap water? You know, these kind of things. Just check. Do you do you pay attention to your your personal care uh, products? Are they organic? Uh, you know, there's so many ways that we we touch ourselves into unnatural things that make us unhealthy. So give yourself a score based on your own knowledge, one to ten, and then uh, uh, in, in meditation and prayer. So. That if you if you have a good prayer life, I mean, even the literature says that those who pray more, and those who meditate more, live longer, have lower stress, lower heart disease, and so on and so forth. So by the time you go down that path and you start giving yourself a self score, and any score less than six, six or less, you start focusing on that area. You know, give yourself hydration, give yourself more spring water, give yourself more. Uh, I mean, drink less of things instead of water. I mean, I had someone today, even in, in a talk I gave earlier, I hate water. It's like, well, there's a real problem with that. And I've heard that so many times. That is an issue, right? I hate water. I said, well, put tea in your water, white tea, green tea, black tea, some kind of tea and learn to like the tea. The water will come. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There's so, so there's so many issues that we can actually help ourselves in a, in a powerful way throughout the gambit. But nutrition is where you dial in and really make big changes. I like that. So what's the name of the book that you want to Tell us about the name of the book so we can aim some people in that direction. Yeah, the Super Health Diet, the last diet you'll ever need. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, we will, we will uh, give you 10, your first 10 callers on that or however they can contact you. We'll give you 10 of them to give to them. Well, that's very kind. They're happy to do that. That, that book uh, last year, I got it. It'd been out for a while. I've already updated it twice. And last year I got an email from somebody saying, hey, Casey, do you know your book is number one on Amazon and Barnes and Noble right now? I said, well, that's really cool. And I went and looked and it's really true. So it's, it's not because I was promoting the book. It's because I was doing so much on the COVID. Um, you know, I, I was on many shows regarding COVID uh, prevention and treatment and so on. And so people, I guess, found my book, but it's, it's kind of cool. But there's a lot of information in there that will, it's life changing. Well, I'll certainly get a copy for myself. I, I, I uh, want to hear what you have to say specifically. It's like, it's a, it's a lot to absorb in a short period of time in a conversation. Well, I tell you, the thing about the conversation is we're trying to get people to realize, oh, my gosh, I have a lot more control over my health than I was thinking. Oh, you don't yeah. want to you know, delegate your health to your doctor. 
You want to become your own doctor. You know what I'm saying? No, no offense, doctor, but people need to understand themselves, right? Doctor, I don't feel well, you know, take this pill. Well, doctor, what else could I do if I don't feel well? I mean, the doctors are throwing, you know, all kinds of meds at people that oh, the yeah. literature shows that all cause more mortality rises when they take it. So we're just talking about cholesterol lowering medication. All cause mortality increases for people that are taking cholesterol lowering medication. And the other thing that's ironic is that all cause mortality rises for every point. The cholesterol is below 200. And I can't tell you how many people say my total cholesterol is 130. I'm on Lipitor. Oh, my. Uh, that, I mean, you wonder why your brain skips. I mean, there's a lot, a lot wrong with that picture, but that, that goes for so many different meds. Oh, yeah. There's popular misconceptions. And I think there's a fair amount of miseducation among the uh, medical community. Yes, sir. And I don't think it would be entirely accidental either. So kind of segue into you the said it. I didn't, doctor, you said it. I know. I know. It's like the, the issue is I, I spent um, the last four years trying studying what happened to America. And that's how we end up in the same terrain of which is spiritual conflict, spiritual psychological conflict. And it's like, um, and, and it, that was part of it. It's like, what, how, how do we end up here in this crazy mess that we call the, the current moment, right? And it is like, you know, the, your, uh, your work on the, uh, hang on, I get the right terminology here, Great Awakening Project and the Spiritual War for America, because it, 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 I, I started studying and it looked like a, um, I come, my dad's a history professor and I, I granted myself the, um, the, the opportunity to, to study things which are forbidden by uh, establishment history. And it's like, so I, I, I talked to, he can't talk to me about that stuff because it's conspiracy stuff. And it's like, okay. I had this weird conversation with him one time. I said, I asked him the question. I said, you know, it occurs to me that if you think it's a conspiracy, that which I'm talking about, it matters not how much evidence I bring to bear. And he agreed with that, which just about floored me because it's like, it's so con like anti-rational, right? Which is kind of like where we're at. And it's like this, the, the, the circumstances, like it's so unbelievable to the, the, the modern mind, right? The, 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 cause we've been trained to believe, kind of trained to believe the authorities only work in our best interest. And, and that, uh, it's like you mentioned the spiritual life in addition to the material aspects of our existence, which is we've been led away from that pathway for a hundred years. You're exactly correct. You know, what's interesting is there's a Russian guy. I can't think of his name right now. He's a, he's a pretty well-known guy, but he says, that, that you, you cannot subvert any person who is fixed in what they believe. In other words, all the subversion tactics that are used, uh, propaganda, psych warfare, all that stuff is useless against those with a biblical worldview. You know, And so the biggest criticism about those of us with a biblical worldview is you're so close-minded, okay? What they're trying to say is, wait a minute, you're too fixed in what you believe to hear my propaganda, you know? And so psych warfare can't be used against someone who has a, a, a biblical worldview. And that's really profound when you think about it. And they say, lest you not be so open-minded that your brains fall out. That's right. You know, so, so propaganda, that's why they don't want people to be in church. That's why they don't want them to be biblically literate. That's why only 6%, 6.5% six of America have a biblical worldview right now. That's interesting. I I could see that because it, it comes down to it's like yeah, that that it occurred to me that the issue is it's subversion is related to uh, like I call deracination, so uh, unrooting the people from their traditions and past experiences of their forebearers, and it's that's that's because then they're easily manipulated because they're not attached to anything. You're right, not firmly fixed, and so so anyway so. You know, that's the same thing, you know, we, we deal with in medicine. You know, I've, I've been working, you know, for this whole year with groups of conventional docs and never in my short history of 25 years in clinical nutrition has there ever been a situation where conventional docs were rapidly wanting to understand clinical nutrition. Because see, there is no good COVID option without clinical nutrition. And we start realizing that that not being properly nutrified is a great risk factor in getting COVID, but also getting cancer and all kinds of other things. Okay, so it's not COVID specific. But when you think about this, you start thinking, wow, 
this is really interesting that that you know when you have a list of things and, and i even worked with the docs that that published in the proceedings of the academy of uh, integrative medicine they published a a viral uh, infection prevention and treatment protocol which is 100 percent nutritional and that's interesting so we were, we've been able to get docs who are very medical to add nutrition into their medical protocols and we got docs that are very nutritional to add some medicine in certain situations into their medical process like like hydroxychloroquine uh, if, if it gets to a certain stage and ivermectin if it gets to a certain stage and so on. But even the ones in the hospital that are having the most success are using IV vitamin C, IV heparin, IV corticosteroids, all mixed together, plus vitamin D and some other, other nutrients that are having a profound effect on people's survival. And so we now know how to treat COVID. It's not a death sentence anymore. And I know it's not a COVID show, but I'm just saying COVID, uh, all sorts of other diseases, we have the same issues going on. And if we treat them the similarly, you'll have similar results. That's right. That's right. And I think it's a good thing to have a, um, a, a, a wide spectrum of, of response to an uh, individual's condition because it is. It's not, you're not one tiny uh, facet. You're a multifaceted individual with a lot of different things that can be improved upon. Are you suggesting that everyone's a clinical study of one? There you go. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> It's it true. Is. And it's, it's fascinating because it is, you're, you're, you're unique. Everybody's unique. And it's like, okay, and how are we going to work with that? And we work with everybody in reality. They're not, you're not punching machine parts out. You're, uh, you're inter interacting with a unique individual every time you do something. And it's like, okay, it's a one-off, you know, experience difference. Well, we need more docs like you. Well, I, I suppose so. I, I just try to be good and, and try to do right by my patients and <laughs> keep them square. But if you weren't studying on your own, you wouldn't know what you know. Your, your, your medical organizations aren't teaching you what you know. No, the, it, it's like, those are like, like mental wave guides. And it's like, so they're trying to, they're trying to um, like harmonize the, the, the stack of all the doctors that are within that group so that they're um, put, producing coherent signal that, that makes sense to the people who are operating the uh, device that controls the signal. Exactly. <laughs> that's well put. It's like, that's not going to get me in trouble, I think. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the standard of care just means, hey, we've been doing it this way long enough to know that not enough people are dying to cause me to get sued. And if I keep doing it within the way we've been doing it, then I won't get sued. You know, so people need to step out and say, listen, you know, if, if you are high blood pressure, we probably ought to be looking at how much potassium that you're eating. And then, and I always ask, Hey, what's a great, what's the, a great potassium food? And without question, even today, hands go up bananas. And so I say, have you had your 15 bananas today? <laughs> the answer is no. Okay. Bananas are a terrible source of potassium. It's only 300, 350 milligrams, right? You need 4,700 a day at, at a minimum. So when you think about people are average, averaging about a thousand a day, and that means they're 3,700 milligrams short of potassium, then you think about, okay, well, what, what is potassium involved in? What about the sodium potassium pump? What does that run in your body? Oh, just your heart and every cell in your body. You know, so people are eating too much potassium, too much sodium and not enough potassium. So you literally invert the pump. And so you're wondering why people have all kinds of problems with all kinds of things, including blood pressure and stomach acid, because stomach acid is, is made from potassium largely, you know, so so there's the nutrition matters and having the, the right amount of each thing is like a, a, a symphony. That's right. And even an untrained ear can tell if the, if the drums are off, you know, or the strings are off, you know? And so that's the body. That's what we're talking about, correcting the metabolism to the point where you feel well and you perform well. That's very good. Now, they, uh, they don't teach us much in med school about that. They get like a day or two of nutritional maybe a couple hours or eight hours or something like that over the course of two years of class i've interviewed mm, i don't know dozens if not hundreds of doctors on that exact subject and a lot of people say oh, i don't know six hours eight hours and then you go back and check and it's one you know <laughs> right like, yeah and, and and they missed that day you know? <laughs> True. and then when you say okay so what was the level of nutrition they taught you in that class well it wasn't pre-med. Oh yeah. Okay. So what did they teach you? Well, they taught me how warm the peas need to be in the hospital and how to read a potassium on a, on a blood test. But they don't tell you that there's only 1% of the potassium in the blood. 
So that's not a good place to read it anyway. So if somebody, if you, if you had a loved one and they're telling you their potassium's low by blood test, you got problems that you need to deal with, you know, but they don't teach you that either. So, so anyway, so that's what I'm saying. You only know what you know because you decided to know it. And that's what I, I just, I applaud you for that. And, uh, and I wish every doctor would do that. Well, I think that's the right answer. And it's like, it's always, a, it's an interesting unfolding of uh, information because it's like, there's so much to potential to learn. I know like, yeah, there's like, it's, it, you don't know what you don't know. And so it's like, it is, you just go be curious and, and go after it. Like you, your life depends upon it. Cause it sort of does. Right. Yeah. So the concept of superfood nutrition is what I, uh, I invented that category years ago. And what I said was, you know, I was just really looking through, okay, my wife was going through this thing and I'm trying to fix that. I'm saying, you know, what is, how much vitamin C does the human body need? And you go to the RDA and they go, oh, 65 milligrams. What? My dad told me years ago, my mom told me years ago, I needed a thousand milligrams or 2000 or 5,000, depends on what the situation is. How could they be so wrong? And then you start looking at what that RDA actually means. Okay, people go, well, I only need the RDA of 65. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you take 65 a day, you probably will not get scurvy. <laughs> That's all it means. That's all it means. That's right. And then pellagra and all these other diseases. So these minuscule amounts of, of RDA nutrients that you see are all over time, they figured, oh, that's all you need of folic acid to, to not have this disease. That's all you need of vitamin C to not have this disease. That's all you need of vitamin B1 to not have this disease. And, and that is a much different answer to a better question of what is the optimal amount for human performance? That's right. What's the optimal amount for, uh, for antioxidants? How do you combine your antioxidants so that you get all the classes of oxidants that are hitting your body? You have peroxyl, hydroxyl, peroxynitrite, superoxide anum, singlet oxygen, and, and peri, uh, uh, superoxide anum, and, and what is that, uh, uh, hypochlorite. So you got six classes coming after you. So it's like you're, you're, you're rowing your boat, okay? And, you're, and most people are taking like vitamin C or maybe one other thing. So they may have one or two or three of these, these areas somewhat covered, but it's like having you know, six holes in your boat and you only really know where the ones are, the, the, the two or three are, and you're dealing with those, but you don't know that the boat's leaking you know, much more than, than you actually are covering. So you, the antioxidants are like taking a bucket and you know, bailing out the water as it comes right. in, you know? but you have to have all the classes. So that's why you need so many different, you know, different antioxidants combined to play the symphony of antioxidants. antioxidants. And then you have really four pillars of disease. So if you're trying to stop any disease, let's just say cancer, for instance. These are, these are most, almost all cancers, inflammation, oxidation, glycation, angiogenesis. So if you can figure out how to regulate those four processes, you can theoretically stop the, the continuation of the disease in which you are working with. You know? And so there's a lot of literature out there saying, hey, you can actually stop these processes with nutrition even better than what the drugs that are coming out. Cause there, there's a lot of money being spent in, in anti-angiogenic drugs or anti-glycation drugs. And there's a lot of money being spent, but those drugs are not yet even as good as berries and some of the other uh, natural things that we, we use uh, to, to quench versus various you know, antioxidants. So there's, there's so many things we can learn and we can always take it to another level. Like you said, once we learn one thing, we go, wait a minute, there's a whole nother subject now I got to study. I got to study, wow, six classes of oxidants. Now I got to study the classes of antioxidants and how they work together. And so it's called, you know, when you use an oxidant, like, you know, I don't know if you ever saw the studies on beta carotene with smokers, you know, that they would end up with more, uh, more disease. They would get worse. Okay. And so you ask yourself why it's because once an oxidant, antioxidant gets spent, it becomes an oxidant. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have what's called a self-reducing system of ox antioxidants so that when one scavenger takes an electron off of one and makes it unstable, that another antioxidant comes by and, get, and donates another one to keep it stable. So it's called self-reducing. So living fuel, all of them are designed to, to, to regulate those four classes I told you about, plus all six classes of antioxidants, plus restoring the oxidants once they become uh, become unstable. And so it's a very sophisticated way to look at nutrition. Absolutely. But then you got to say, okay, then also we have nutrition in there for all 12 major body systems. 
all 12. And so when you start looking at the, the types of nutrients, the kinds of nutrients, the combinations, how it works together, it's a, it's truly miraculous how it finally came together. And we've, we're now in our 19th year. I'm sorry, we're in our 18th year. Our 19th year is coming in, in March. Time's a wasting, right? <laughs> yes. That's awesome, man. Quite an amazing feat. Quite an amazing feat to even learn about it. But necessity is the mother of invention. I agree with that. Yeah. So, so it was my wife's story that had me, you know, meet all of the top clinical nutritionists and, and functional medicine guys and all, all the people you could name from, you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, 25 years ago. So that that's how I started because of my wife. And, and the more I learned, you know, finally one day I said, you know what, Monica, I really am not enjoying putting a uh, hundred pills together for you to take over the day and also mixing all the stuff in the blender. And I can't right. even find the great stuff. I can't find the organic version, the non-GMO version. I can't find what I want. And so I said, I'm going to make the perfect food. And she goes, you do that, honey. And so, so really over a period of a year, uh, when, when I finished, literally we, we had, we had to deliver to our house from the docks. We thought worst case scenario, we'd have a lifetime supply for our family. And the same day my daughter Grace was born, we, we call it the grace of God. So the same day, 18 years ago, March 25th, 2002, the company was born and my daughter was born. And by the end of that year, we're in every state in the United States, including Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Because we make a level of nutrition that has not ever otherwise existed. And even 18 years later, there's not a close second uh, to living fuel. Quite interesting. Now, I, I presume you go over this in your book. I do. Very good. I like I got too much education ahead of me now. <laughs> well, you'll enjoy it because you, 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 you're like a sponge. You enjoy this stuff. So it's, it's quite referenced for you also. So you can check all my references. Please Very go for it. Good. Very good. Like I say, it's the, the, it is, it is the, this, this connection between medicine and um, I say well-being yeah, as, a, as a medicine is like management of illness is a misguided pathway. Whereas I'm interested in well-being and, and let's be, learn how to be healthy and make people be healthy and stay healthy and not manage illness. That seems like the bad way to go. Preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. I mean, listen, if, if, if there wasn't such thing as a, a you know, medical privacy, you know, wouldn't it be nice to go to your doctor's office and say, hey, doctor, I got this thing going on with my heart. I just want to call a couple of your patients that came in with the same thing and left without it. That's right. And we go, uh... Well, you know, that doesn't happen. Well, yeah, it does. Just not in conventional medicine. If you keep treating it the way they've been treating it, you're going to keep getting results that they've been getting. That's it. That's a definition of insanity, right? Ah, yes, it is. And I didn't make it up, but I still use it plenty. But the, but the, but the truth is, that's really would be nice, wouldn't it? You know, if somebody's got a particular health situation, they go to the doc, you know, a urologist and says, doc, has this ever been, uh, can I talk to some patients you healed this for? Well, we didn't heal anybody. No, oh, you haven't. So it's a slow ride. You, you know, when you're 60 years old, average people have on, on five or six drugs. Well, the meds have an interaction. We have that in medicine. We call that, uh, what is that called? It's called uh, drug-induced, what? Polypharmacy, iatrogenic problems. There's, there, there you go. There's a bunch of different ways to call it. Yeah, so, so it's, it's medically, uh, a drug, a pharmace pharmacologically induced dementia. Oh, okay. Wow. And, and that happens so much. I mean, even my dad, my, my wife and I went to see my dad one time before he died. And, and he was like, so out of it. And my wife said, I don't, I don't know if he's going to make it much longer. And so I went to the nurse's station and said, could I see his drug sheet, please? They had him on 17 meds, I think it was. And I called the doctors, you get him off every med that isn't saving his life right now. And so within two or three days, he was sharp as attack again. See, you know, the whole drill, you know, you have a, you take a med, it causes your, your lower back to hurt, which is really your kidneys. And then they give you something for that. And then they give you a muscle relaxant and they give you this and this and this. By the time they're done, you don't even know where you are. Well, yeah, there's, a, there's, some, there's a rule that's like after six meds or something like that, you don't really know what they're doing anymore. They're interacting. Yeah, I read this study. It's five. After five meds, you cannot judge the clinical uh, result. So you can't, you can't predict it. Doctors tend to add them on and not take them off. Yeah, but see, the thing is that it's the doctor adds what the last doctor did. It doesn't want to come against the last doctor. So we'll just fix that with another one. And it becomes a big problem. People don't realize it. And they just get used to subclinically feeling bad. And that's pretty sad. Yeah, it is. It's like, uh, you know, and then they say it's old age. And I'm like, oh, my, I hate to hear that noise. Well, then they send them to you and they get fine, right? 
that's what we do our best right we try to it's it's an amazing thing because it's like people latch on to things it's like if they, they ad- identify with a medical problem like the patient might say something like, well, that's my fibromyalgia. So they're, they're ego identified with their, this problem. And I'm like, well, you don't want to identify with that thing. That is not your friend. We call it their teddy bear. They really hold their teddy. It's really sad. It's sad. So yeah. folks let go of your teddy bears, get feeling good. And that'll be the greatest witness. You don't, you tell people how good you feel, not how bad you feel. That's right. My uncle told me this. I was in my first year of med school and he was a psychiatrist in Lexington, Kentucky. I was driving through there on my way to uh, take care of some business in Virginia, back to Kansas City, Missouri. I was visiting him and he says, I'm taking biochemistry and such. And he goes, Brad, it's all hypnosis. And I'm like, "What? The I don't even know what that means. And then 10 years later, I'm practicing medicine. I'm like, shoot, he was right. No question. It's all, this is mental game how you interpret what's going on and how you face up to the music and interact with it appropriately will determine your outcome. And there wouldn't be a thing called a placebo effect if there wasn't an effect. That's correct. Right. That's correct. And it's it, what, a, what an amazing thing the mind is. And, and that, I, I've become more and more interested in that as my um, practice has progressed. Cause it is, it's like, you see the person they'll, they'll, they'll say something that shows that they're, latched on to the anchor that's dragging them to the bottom. And I'm like, yeah, you don't want to just let go of that thing and move forward in a different way. You got to process the information differently to get a different result. Amen. You know, it's funny because, because even today I heard uh, a lady talk about, yeah, my daughter, you know, she started having colitis, you know, three years ago and we've tried everything. And my response is, well, what traumatic happened to her three years ago? Oh yeah, she got a divorce and this and this and this. Okay, well, it is stuck trauma that's causing the colitis. That's all it is, you know, and you're trying to deal with every other thing. You have to look at breast cancer normally has a major trauma associated with that, you know? So so these that's one thing you have to look at. You have to look at the psycho-emotional connection in a patient because people who don't forgive have, have stuck trauma and people who have been hurt you know, emotionally by death or by divorce or by abuse or whatever, there are things that are stuck. I mean, we can measure it now, but it used to be Chinese medicine used to say, uh, in fact, they had a chart from, I don't know, 2000 years before Christ, where they would show uh, the major organ system. They show the five major organs. Yes. They can, they say, yeah, if you have, you have uh, unforgiveness, you have bitterness, you have gallbladder problems. I mean, literally this is in the literature. Okay, this is in the charts. It's astounding. In fact, you know, I had a doctor friend tell me that he 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 graduated medical school with this guy, and ten in ten years after out of medical medical school, the guy said he was going to write a book on Chinese medicine, and and he and he said, well, how long do you think it's going to take you? He said, man, it might take me two to three years. Well, thirty years later, he released the book. Okay, because it is so intricate, and you realize he says that that Chinese medicine knew everything we know between 100 and 2000 years before we knew it in medicine. And so you can't just ignore all that. That's revelation from heaven. That's that right. All good things come from above. How do you know you stick your, your needle in somebody's toe and they're going to fix something somewhere else in the body? Crazy That's business. That at. medicine is crazy. Yeah. It's it so- God, your energy's out of balance. We just, you know, fascinating. It's legit. So, so the energetic system of the body is one of the systems that we ignore in conventional medicine. We ignore energetics. Now, go back, and I'm actually writing a book on the subject, but go back to the Jesuits in, uh, in 2000 years ago. They had this famous saying, they said, give me the boy until he's seven years old and I will show you the man. That is a f- astounding thing that they figured out because one to seven, the, the children are in theta brainwave. Theta brainwave means that they are soaking in everything they see, everything they hear, everything they feel, everything that happens to them. And by the time they get to be seven, they start closing that down and start forming a conscious mind. There's no conscious mind before that. So then by the time they're 13, they have the the brain, the subconscious brain waves, the patterns on which they're going to build their life. And so when you realize that when bad things happen in that period of time, it causes some real messed up patterns in the subconscious, uh, in the subconscious patterns that require that there are ways to fix. And so that's a piece of medicine we got to look at. We got to say, okay, wait a minute. If there was a trauma 
and she has a physiologic disease because of the trauma, how do we deal with that trauma? Well, medicine now is talking about PTSD. They're using things like EMDR. Have you seen that? Yep, yep. EMDR, eye movement disassociation, something. Uh, but they, they literally haven't, it's like the number one way they're treating PSD now, PTSD now. You know, so they're releasing people from this horrible bind, you know, bound up life with techniques like that. But there are at least a dozen techniques like that that have some level of, of uh, power to, to change the subconscious mind. But the one that I found that's the coolest is that when you go to sleep, you go right back into theta brainwave. Okay, so, so conscious mind, they say 10,000 times it takes to, to become a maestro. 10,000 times because we're using a conscious mind to imprint a subconscious mind. And so when you're talking about the, the computer, the subconscious mind is 1 million times more powerful than the conscious mind. Right. So you have to imprint that perfectly over and over and over and over and over again to bring it about change. So it's a very inefficient way to do that. But if you go back to the subconscious while you're asleep, and for instance, if you record some very positive biblical declarations or scriptures or whatever, or things about yourself, and you listen to it while you sleep, you literally can reprogram the subconscious mind, overwrite the, the negative programming in a very short period of time. It's pretty astounding. I like that. There's good, good research on that. But I mean, I know I did, we didn't come here necessarily to talk about that, uh -huh. but it just came up. So you didn't tell me what else to talk about. I don't want to got no plan on what to talk about. I'm just kind of interesting exploring where your consciousness is going. It's very interesting. It's quite yes. a process, quite a process of, uh, like I say, it's an, uh, the exploration of what we are as human beings and how we uh, interact with the world is, is just an amazing uh, event, you know, ongoing and, and, and amazing uh, revelations to occur. Yes, sir. As we go. But there's a better way to do medicine. You know, it's just don't, people, they, they want to keep doing what they've been doing. There's not a transaction. They got to get out of the transaction mentality. Ooh, right. I'm sick. I'm going to the doctor. I'm giving my copay. He's going to give me a, a prescription. Thank you very much. That's the transaction. People are used to that transaction. But wouldn't it be nice if the doctor said, oh, no, do this and this and this and this. Oh, don't take anything or go home and drink this or that or whatever. Get some extra sleep. Put some magnesium in your bath, Epsom salts, and you'll be better. And, and you didn't, you paid your copay, but you didn't buy any drugs. Wouldn't that be interesting if, if I mean, there are doctors that do that? That's right. I like that. It's relational instead of uh, it's transactional. I like that yeah. a lot. Because it is the uh, the uh, get the teach the people how to be well to make themselves better without your help, then you're providing an actual high value service to the community. Amen. So now you're their consultant, if you will, instead of you know doctor's orders to take these antibiotics or whatever, you know. So I, I mean, I, I'm a little uh, a little chaste about that, you know, the way people are treated, you know, and they go home and they're so not better and. You know, their health is not good and they don't feel good and they don't sleep well. And it's like, you know, in Orlando, we call that a clue. You know, when you keep doing something and it's causing you, you to feel worse, maybe you should consider another path. That's right. I like that a lot. That's very good. Like I say, uh, um, I'm going to read your book. I got to catch up to you a little bit here. I got, I'm like way behind. I'm like, oh, I'm got understudied. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Maybe you could, maybe you should teach me something right now. Cause I know that you, in your practice, you got, you've, you've had some ahas. I love ahas. So what's your, what's your coolest aha? It's what's fascinating to me is this is, is um, I was, I was talking to a lady. I'll tell you a story about a patient. So she was in a automobile accident a driver. Her husband was in the passenger seat and, and um, she was driving in a, in, in Phoenix down there, very crowded. And um, she got, T-boned in the intersection by a 16-year-old driver who's still learning how to drive, as you probably can imagine, mm. and it's and and it, through no fault of her own, but it was quite shocking to her and um, traumatic. But she was not majorly injured, but some minor injuries, but major anxiety associated with that. Is what what happened was um, she tells me this. She says she her anxiety is acting up and she lost her confidence. Is what she told me. I said this is a terrible story you're telling yourself, because it's true. As long as you tell yourself that story, it's true. Okay. So she, does she say she lost her confidence because she, she doesn't go do the things she used to do because she doesn't feel like it. So she's depressed too, she says. And I'm like, okay. So I had to unpack all this. And I'm like, she says she get a feeling in her diaphragm and it's doing this thing. And she goes, that's my anxiety and it's getting worse. And I said, really? Okay. 
And she, the, the, her husband told me this, he was sitting with her and he's like, they're talk, trying to get me to refer him to a psych to talk, somebody to talk to. I'm like, so not wanting to do that because I don't know what's going to be said. And I don't know that they're going to give her a diagnosis makes her on the treadmill, you know? So um, husband says she's, she can ride as the passenger. And um, when she's riding as a passenger, she says, be careful. And I said, that's interesting to process that one. I'm like, well, she's right. That's good advice when you're driving because driving's dangerous. I said, but when she says that, I want you to say the exact same thing every time. Like, that's good advice. I will drive carefully because driving can be dangerous and she'll get tired of you saying it. So she'll stop cueing you, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's good. So then I said, this thing, this thing where there's a signal coming from your diaphragm and you say, that's your anxiety. I'm saying that is a signal coming from your body trying to tell you something. And it has to keep up in the amplitude of the signal until you accept the, the message. Your interpretation of the signal is that it's your anxiety is not correct. You're, what's the signal really saying? And the signal's really saying, I was in an accident. And it wasn't my fault. And as soon as you accept that, the signal will die down because the message has been received and the body doesn't need to generate the signal anymore because it was it traumatic. It was traumatic. And 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 you're you're being afraid of the signal makes you in a positive feedback cycle that's the anchor dragging her down. And so I said, I just gave her my clues on how to deal with the anxiety. And you know, it's like this, it's all about how you process the information. Because it's not the signal that's the problem, but it's the interpretation of the signal that you attach to and falsely believe is the correct answer that's driving you to your destruction. And that's the, that's the, that's the mental model I'm, I'm working on. That's kind of I mean, interesting. That's super interesting. I'll, I'll tell you a story that's very relevant. My son, when he was eight, uh, he, he, we were going to go on the boat. Uh, we had a jet boat and we we're going to take the dog for the first time. So the dog jumps in the boat, we all get in the boat and it's a really loud jet boat. So I, I take off and just really gun it. And the dog freaks out and starts running back and forth in the boat and falls out of the boat. The dog's never been in, in the water before. Uh, so my son is screaming, ah, I said, no, don't worry, don't worry. Dogs can swim, dogs, don't worry. So I, so I pulled around, turned the boat off, called the dog, swam over, got in the boat, everything was fine. Except everything wasn't fine. Because the next time I tried to get Joshua to go in the boat, he couldn't, would not go in the boat. He had a phobia of going in the boat. No matter what you did, you couldn't get him even on the dock, not to mention in the boat. So it, it's, it was like really freaking us out. I had to, everybody lay hands on him, pray for him, tried everything. And then a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Scott Hainan, who's a chiropractic neurologist, he was coming to teach at the chiropractic show in Orlando uh, oh, several years ago. I think it was 2014 or something like that. And, and so he, he was visiting and I, so I told him the story. He goes, oh, that's easy. I go, what do you mean that's easy? He says, it's an open loop. I said, what do you mean? He says, he gets in a situation, like you walk through and you, you step on a twig and it snaps and you remember you being in a war, okay? And guns were shooting and whatever. So that trigger triggers a unresolved uh, process. And I, said, and I said, he said, that's easy. So he goes in his car and he gets his medical laser, cold laser, which you've seen them. They, they put a little code in it and he just put zzz, 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 and then he goes, so Joshua, how about we go on the boat? He goes, okay. He went on the boat, never had another problem. I thought, oh my gosh, there's something <laughs> missing. There's something missing in medicine that these guys, these chiropractic neurologists know how simply to close a loop. And that was just like spinning out of control, never resolving. And now it's resolved. And he has never, never been afraid again. It's like, that is amazing. So I'll give you one other little trick. You know, anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety is oftentimes adrenal fatigue. Okay. So the, adrenal, the adrenals are so fatigued that they're on edge and anything can set them off. And the thing that often sets them off is carbohydrates. People eat sugar and carbohydrates. And what happens is that blood sugar keeps coming up and down. When the blood sugar goes up and then it crashes, the signal is sent by the adrenals to shut off the insulin. Well, the, sig the adrenals are tired so that the insulin goes lower and lower and lower. And then you get this little shake and this demand in your mind 
or carbohydrates or sugar to bring the blood sugar back up. So people, if they catch it in time, it goes back up and then back down. And so, the, so you have this, this yo-yo that's wearing out your adrenals more and more. And then eventually it's just a droom, a bang or adrenal release that goes up the back. They don't know if they're a heart attack or what's going on. And that is their anxiety that's going on. I learned that from through Monica and now many hundreds of others that we've helped through this, that get rid of the sugar and the what, if it's white, it ain't right. If it's carbohydrate, because we got to, make sure you stabilize the blood sugar for a period of time until the adrenals can restore. And the other thing that, that exacerbates this is people having the Wi-Fi where they sleep. In other words, if you can find a signal on your phone in your room and the Wi-Fi is on, particularly if it's 5G, but even if it isn't, what you do is you, you basically puts the brain in what's called high beta and high beta causes adrenal stress. So that, that's an adrenal response. That's a fight or flight response full time. And so that people can tell if they're in it because they just can't stop thinking about stuff when they go to bed. That means you're stuck in beta, high beta. And so that means you're in adrenal stress. Usually a person like you're talking about will have low thyroid. Well, why do you have low thyroid? Because you can't be in growth and repair and adrenal stress at the same time. So if the adrenals are high, the thyroid is low. So then we just, as in medicine, we go, let's just treat the thyroid. Well, you didn't treat the adrenals. And now you end up with, a, with adrenal stress and, or adrenal fatigue and that sort of thing. So, so there you have it. That's good. Now a good little mini um, medical educational seminar for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> for us, for everybody. It's all very good. It's all very good. And like I say, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting a copy of your book, which I will get, purchase without delay. No, just text me. I'll, I'll get it to you with those other ones. I will do it. I thank you, sir. And I want to, Casey Krejci, wonderful man, wonderful work. I look forward to learning more about you and interacting more with you in the near future. Livingfuel.com. Wonderful. I'm going to check it out. And uh, I thank you again for speaking with me, sir. God bless you, brother. It was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Best Medicine Podcast with Bradley H. Werrell, D.O. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe below, either over there or over there. Also, if you're interested in a medical consultation with myself, there's also information below.